Well, I think that uh, everybody is uh, settled in, it looks like. Um, as I uh, kind of told you, Pam, um, we have uh, about 20 students. Um, several of them are uh, already shooting. They're shooting, what? they're uh, doing play-by-play -play for Fighting Irish Media. Uh, several of them are student athletes and they're trying to figure out you know, how to continue their careers once they graduate. And then some of the students are just are in journalism or uh, they're got a couple of uh, students who are in Mendoza Business School and they're just wanting to learn more about broadcasting, sports, how you get into it, things like that. So that kind of gives you a little bit of background on the students. Um, for everyone in the class, and I've told them a little bit about you, but um, Pam was at ESPN when I joined. She took me under her wing. Uh, she uh, <laughs> she showed me where all the good restaurants were. She told me uh, uh, about all the cool places to go and some places not to go. And uh, she was my buddy in uh, uh, Bristol, Connecticut, because when you're in Bristol, Connecticut, you're kind of just there in Bristol, Connecticut. So you need you need friends within the building. And uh, Pam certainly uh, was one of my good friends. But besides that, uh, she made history at ESPN. She was the first woman on the network to broadcast Division I college football, play by play. She did it for the Big Ten. She did it for years. Uh, now she does, as you uh, may have heard her say earlier, she does um, women's college basketball. You're gonna be doing softball? Uh, softball. Yep, yeah, in WNBA. Yeah, oh, great. So so she's out there doing a lot of different formats for play-by-play. -play. And we've talked about play-by-play -play in class, about the preparation and things like that. And as I mentioned to you, Pam, earlier, uh, we're now talking about interviewing and kind of the structure of interviewing and how you get a good interview, what is a good interview things like that. So what I will do is, Pam, I will turn it over to you. I'll let you talk a little bit about your career, how you got started, how you got into the play-by-play -play business. Um, questions, if anybody has questions, make sure. Shannon, are you uh, muted? You are now. <laughs> it's all right. Uh, when we uh, get into it, Again, if you have questions, uh, let Mr. Kelly know, put it in the chat, whatever. Uh, we'll be open for questions for the next hour. So anything you want to ask, please do. Okay. And I will turn it over to you. All right, and Betsy, if you have any, any way you want to steer me, let me know. Um, if that banner behind you, did I sign that? Am I on that? Or you just got the big ones? This is this is a story. And I've, <laughs> I've told it before in class, a little bit of the story, but... Um, the ESPN banner that I have behind me, it's its no accident that it's behind me. Uh, what we would do at ESPN is up in our offices on the third floor, we would put up, and everybody has seen these ESPN banners at, at games. We could go downstairs and get a blank one, and we'd put them up in our offices, and we'd put them in the hallway. And when anybody back at our hometown would ask us for an auction item to raise money for a nonprofit, usually we grab one of these banners, we'd put it up, and we'd put a note on it and say, please sign it for big brothers, big sisters. And so as people walk by, they would sign it. And uh, this one I got for a local charity. It's got Chris Berman on it. It's Ooh. got um, Butchie Gras. It's got, um, it's got Scott on it. It's got um, all kinds of people there. Um, Not but, me. Yeah, and and you, but you know, and everybody kept it up until Stuart Scott signed it and Chris Berman signed it. You know, right. you get the big ones and then walk away. Yeah, yeah. So we kept it up <laughs> until we got those big signatures. But I got this for a nonprofit here in town. I was at that particular um, event, and I thought, you know what, I want that banner. And here's why I wanted that banner. As I have mentioned to the class before, when you and I started at ESPN, over all the platforms, there were probably 50 some odd anchors. Five of them were women. Five Ooh. of them were women. And that was Robin Roberts. Um, let's see, I've got... Uh, Would have been Linda. Uh, I got uh -huh. Linda on there. Chris McKendry. Uh, I've got Chris McKendry. I've got you and I've got me. That's five. That's it. That's five. That was it. 
And yeah. that's why I wanted that banner hmm. because of all the anchors that were at ESP. And at that particular time when we were there, there were five women. And that's why I wanted that banner because the five of us, we had, you know, kind of our own buddy system as well, because it was us, you know, and all these other guys. So that's why I have it there. And that's why I, I wanted you guys to see that because it was by the time that Pam and I got to ESPN, Disney had owned it. And if you had read any of the ESPN books, you know, some of the fraternity house stories that flew around. It, it, by the time that we got there, it wasn't quite like that, but it was still an old boys network. And then and, you know, Dan and Keith were, were the giants at 11 o'clock that were anchoring. And it was still a, a, an old boys um, room and an old boys network. So the five of us kind of stuck together like that. But that's why it is so special. I think that when you watch ESPN now, there are so many women, although Pam and I have talked before that, you know, if if we if we were uh, trying to get to ESPN now, they probably wouldn't hire us. But, you know, but that's OK. That's all right. You know, we were we were there and we got to work studio shows. And then, you know, Pam, as I said, uh, drifted out. Uh, and now she's she's doing really what her passion is, is play by play and being on the road and, you know, being able to go to all these great games. So um, that is a long introduction into why I have that banner. <laughs> it's a banner to have. Yeah, it is. So Pam, I'll turn it over to you and I'll kind of let you talk about how I got in the business and some of the things you're doing now. And again, any questions, please um, raise your hand or let Mr. Kelly know and uh, we will go from there. Go ahead, Pam. Okay. Uh, thanks, Betsy. And uh, yeah, sorry, I apologize for the lighting. I have terrible lighting. This is the first time I've talked to a class. It's about to become painfully obvious to all of you, but uh, uh, thrilled to, especially to be with Notre Dame students. I did the ACC softball tournament there last year in the spring. And I'd only been there in the dead of winter when, quite frankly, just getting from your car to uh, Joyce Center was a victory. So when I was there in the spring, it was gorgeous. And I got to tour your campus and your facilities there are amazing, the, the uh, TV facilities. So I hope, you know, I, I guess, Betsy, a lot of your students have taken advantage of that and get to work in there. And that's something certainly when we were growing up, growing, growing up like Betsy and I started at ESPN in the last century, 1996. So, and things have changed uh, dramatically since then. A lot of things are still the same, unfortunately, but uh, I think the, uh, just to get the boring part out of the way, I started, I went to the University of Maryland, couldn't get into Notre Dame or any other good school. So I went to Maryland. I, this is all I ever wanted to do was, was to be, believe it or not, growing up, you know, in the 70s, the 1970s, was to be, uh, was to be a play-by-play -play person. And there were no women basically doing anything in sports. Uh, Phyllis George was, uh, was, a, was a studio host on NFL Today on CBS and that she was a former Miss America and that was she was pretty much it. And fortunately I had family and parents who did not tell me that my dream was probably never going to come true because at that time there were zero opportunities. Uh, maybe even to be there were very few reporters even. But uh, anyway so I just kind of stuck with it I had a couple of grandmothers who were very encouraging to me, who never had opportunities really to do anything except, you know, once they had children, that's what you did. You were moms, nothing wrong with that. But the, it's just that the opportunities back then are nothing, certainly compared to what you have. Being able to work while you're in school to get valuable experience, hands-on experience. Uh, so I graduated from Maryland, took me a couple of years just to find a job. I worked in a small radio station on the Eastern shore of Maryland, which literally was in an old house. I did, I was the news director of a one and a half person news team and did play by play for high school where I actually went and set up my own equipment. I don't even know if these things could even plug in now anymore. And we basically called games over radio, over uh, telephone lines. And then I got a job at a small TV station, in the Eastern shore of Maryland by basically lying my way into the job. I said I had a tape, but it was, you know, the, my dog ate it or whatever my excuse was. Got myself an interview, got into the building and they hired me. And then I went from there. I did traffic, uh, traffic reports on radio. And then finally I got into sports radio in Cleveland, Ohio, uh, because I happened to call a friend of mine about something else. And she said, I bet you're calling about the Cleveland radio station, which was just starting up. 
And I worked there for less than a year, but had the time of my life. Bill Belichick's first year as the Browns head coach. And you think he's he was a joy to, to deal with back then? No. He, he was just starting out, would wear old sweatshirts to all of his, uh, all of his TV appearances. He was a piece of work. But it was just, uh, so I went from Cleveland, then to Washington, D.C., Baltimore, all doing radio. And then uh, finally started doing games on a freelance basis for ESPN, college women's basketball games, as, get this, an analyst. Uh, this was probably 1993 or four. And they just didn't, they needed women. They were so desperate. And I played high school basketball. I was on the team. I peaked at 11 years of age. So I was the most underqualified analyst ever. But fortunately, as soon as I got into it, I started saying, I really want to do play by play. You plant that in their ear. And then in 96, Betsy and I were part of the original ESPN news team. I think Betsy at one point, we maybe had 10 total anchors doing a 24 hour news cycle. So we got our butts kicked each and every day. Um, but uh, it was great experience, certainly. And once I signed with ESPN, I've been there full time 27 years, which I know it's terrifying. So uh, I about I guess I think eight years in, I totally became play by play. And in 2000, God, I went to uh, John Walsh, who is a brilliant man. If you guys ever want to Google him or look him up, totally brilliant man who who brought journalistic integrity to ESPN. Uh, and it's no, you know, he's not with the company anymore, but I went to his office and somebody had written, it was Rudy Martsky in USA Today, which is a newspaper. I think it's still around. Um, and he had written an article about how there's no, basically women are sideline reporters in football. That's the way it is. And they were, they were mostly sideline reporters. And I rather dramatically went into his office and plunked the paper down and said, I don't want to read this anymore. I want to do football. And miraculously, they agreed. So I did football there for 11 years. Um, very, uh, very mixed uh, emotions about doing football. It's, uh, it was, it was, it was a, a rather, it was an interesting journey for me. And then I was also doing uh, women's basketball college play-by-play -play and softball I've been doing since, gosh, probably the last 18 years. And then the WNBA in the summer, which is the greatest summer job in America, because you get to go to nice cities and stay in nice hotels and call basketball. So that's, um, that's kind of what, that's just kind of bringing me up now to where I am. I'm actually going to call a Notre Dame game Sunday at Boston College. Is KK on? Is she here? So KK, Bransford, big one against Duke the other day on the road. That was a big one. Uh, so I, I've gotten to, I've been to 47 states, mostly on ESPN's dime. And uh, just basically when I started, I had no plan B. I don't know, literally don't know. I'm not smart enough to teach. I don't know what I would be doing. So uh, fortunately, I was able to get into this business. And it was at a time when I think unlike now, the opportunities and not just necessary for women, but that's a whole nother subset. There weren't there weren't really a lot of jobs because now you have, you know, as you guys know, everything, all the streaming services, you can get opportunities when you're in school. So as I said, it took me a couple of years even to find like a low level radio job. And I think the beautiful thing now with you, with your generation, is you have these opportunities to learn while you're going to school. And that gives you, like, you won't have to lie about having a tape like I did. You can just, you can actually get that experience. And I certainly hope that all of you uh, can take advantage of that. So um, that's basically the boring part of my life. And then, um, I don't know if you want me to talk about what, uh, preparation for play-by-play -play or, or what, do you, what, do you, what are you thinking, Betsy? Yeah, let's start a little bit. And we've talked, I've had uh, some of the other guests talk about preparation, but uh -huh. but I told them at the beginning of the semester, I said, we're going to hammer this into your head, how much you have to prepare, how much yeah. you have to study. Yeah. Um, and uh, 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 Jason, are there any questions real quick before we go into play-by-play um, -play prep or should we just jump into it? Let's see if we got some questions. Uh, no, it looks like they'll take the play-by-play -play prep first. Excellent, okay. okay. All right, so football is one thing, basketball is another thing, softball is another thing. When you've got basketball, okay, you've got five basically on each side that you have to worry about and then the subs. Football, I've told them that Mike Tirico comes in with a stack like this, of yes. what he has, his different highlighters, things like that. So. Let's talk about the prep and the differences of the preparation between like 
a football game and a basketball game. Yeah, football is a beast. And Mike, Mike was on staff. <clears throat> uh, he was an anchor who was going into play-by-play -play when I was at ESPN. And he's the one I actually went to to get advice. And he preps like no one I have ever seen. And he does. He has a binder for football that's, as he's right, it's at least two inches thick, stuff on every player. And he, I don't want to say he over-prepares, but he's prepared like nobody ever. Uh, and football is, basically, it's a seven-day-a-week job because you do your game, there's travel. On Wednesdays, we would uh, we would travel. I'm, tr I'm trying to get this right. On Wednesdays, actually, we would talk to the offensive coordinators, the defensive coordinators, and the head coach uh, by conference call now on Zoom. Thursday, you would travel. Friday, you would meet the home team in person. Those three coaches plus practice. Sometimes you would talk to players. There were some schools that didn't want us talking to players. Um, but um, so that, that we would see maybe that they weren't the sharpest tools in the drawer. But um, and then Saturday you do the game. And if you're fortunate, you would be able to get out on Saturday, maybe come home Sunday. And then the process would start on Monday. And with so many players and so much information, it was it's really I don't know. I didn't realize how much work it was until I stopped doing football and you could actually take a breath. Uh, so football is by far I, the most intensive and least time efficient project I've ever worked on because the night before we would have meetings and some producers, I swear, would do three hour meetings. And the game, of course, is three and a half hours. So it was it's just a, it's a lot and it's a lot to try to keep in your brain. But basically, once the game starts, the game kind of takes over. So I would say 90 percent, certainly easily of what I prepared. 90, 95% of the graphics would never even make air because the, once the game starts, it's a whole new story. You can have all this background and all this stuff. And once the game starts, all the statistics are, you know, they're, they're no longer valid. So football was, is an all encompassing thing. And I know there's some sort of, you know, people think if you do football, it's like a feather in your cap or something like that, but it's, it's, it was, it's totally a seven day a week, for four months of the, out of the year, you basically have no life. You're just traveling, doing football, going to meetings, things like that. Basketball, on the other hand, so much fun. You, As Betsy mentioned, you have five starters, obviously. I know Notre Dame right now is going about seven deep. And fortunately, because I've been doing it so long, you get to know the players. And once you get to the point where you don't, like I couldn't even tell you uh, KK's number or Hannah Hidalgo's number to save my life, but I know what they look like. So that makes it a lot easier. Whereas in football, you're way up in a booth. And a lot of most people call football off a TV monitor in the booth because there's so much going on the field. You can see much better on the monitor. So basically, they're calling the game from a television set. Basketball, obviously, everything we're on the floor. Everything's in front of you. It's east to west the whole time. And it's 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 more fun. You get more access to players, depending on who the coach is. Neil Ivey, the head coach at Notre Dame, is terrific with that. And just to, to back. 2001, I was Notre, the sideline reporter for the Final Four when Notre Dame won the whole damn thing in St. Louis. And so, and Niel was a senior on that team. So I've known Niel for, gosh, almost half a century. So anyway, um, so basketball is like that. Softball, a uh, little bit more players. And, and that was more difficult to prep for because when I started my first softball game that I called at ESPN, 2005 Women's College World Series. And back then there weren't, I swear, I mean, I was sitting down and I fortunately I had great analysts who were with me and, and we would sit down with players and I had no idea who they were and they had to point them out on the rosters because we didn't have, we didn't, they, no softball basically wasn't on television until the World Series. And now that's changed and that's changed prep because now, you know, those with ESPN plus, I can go in and I can look at archive games and, you know, watch games and typically we'll watch a game before I do a team. That way you get much more familiar with not just stories, but again, what the players look like and, and what the you know th things the coaches do. So that has changed prep a million percent, almost to the point where there's almost too much information out there right now, because you could just get bogged down in it. But, um, but yeah, the slightly different, in, uh, certainly different from football. Football's like out there on an island by itself. The, the island, I'm um, gonna kick your butt as you prepare for a game. And then uh, basketball and softball, similar preparation, but all of the stuff like the you know, Notre Dame students, when you guys, you know, I, you guys get your butts kicked, the ones who were just cranking out all of these live events, but we're able to go back and look at these archived events and that helps us tremendously. So that's changed a lot.
Pam, you uh, mentioned about calling a game basically on the monitor, you know, when you're up there with doing soccer or doing lacrosse uh, right. and doing football, as you mentioned. During COVID, did you stay home and call games? Yes. How, did, how did they work that? Yeah, uh, the pandemic changed everything. So we, you know, things shut down in March of 2020. So basically uh, you had some time off and then ESPN and other other entities did that set us up with a home kit. So we're basically calling games off Zoom, which is remarkable and couldn't have happened probably even five years before. And so, yes, we uh, we had light kits sent. We had all this stuff sent to us, uh, headphones, the whole nine yards. And you're calling game off, calling games off of a monitor. And that really uh, other than that, things would not have gone on the air because, as you guys know, um, everything was shut down. There was no travel. We couldn't have access. When we finally did start doing games. There were no fans. We all had to get tested all the time. We had to wear masks, which isn't good when you're, you know, trying to, to broadcast. And the, I guess it was a good thing, bad thing, because not just ESPN, but everybody realized you could get away with not sending announcers uh, and not sending, you know, producers and directors. They were, they were uh, basically production trucks. Or I think ESPN for football this year has four production trucks. And that's it. Every game used to be you get a full production truck. Now they're all done out of control rooms, which again is great for experience for, for people who are coming up. But but as a logistical for us, it's not good. And so anyway, so we were doing games from home and that has carried over. And there are still, like when I did softball last year, I did quite a few games from home, which is not ideal. You know, softball is a 360 degree sport. So you don't know where the ball's going. You have to be really um, careful and slow with your calls because something that looks like a pop-up could be a home run and vice versa. So you have to kind of dial it down a little bit, um, but it, it's not ideal and it does save not as much money, I think, as you would think. And certainly I think they can move the numbers around, but that's something that's never going to go away. And you see it again, not just with our network, but all across the board. And it's, it's not ideal. Sometimes it's nice not to travel and to be on your couch, you know, with a beer half hour after you're done, but, but, it's, you know, it's, it's really changed thing and, and things. And we're, I don't think we're ever going back from that. And for basketball this year, for me, I've traveled, I've traveled nonstop. So it's, it's, it's different things because so many, especially a lot of the games that are just streaming most of the time, I would say those are, those are done from home kits. And you also deal with the delay, which is spectacular. So that's, <laughs> there's all sorts of problems that go on, go along with that, but you know, you're able to get basically every game that's out there is now available to be available to be seen. Yeah. And, and I've done games. Um, well, before UC went to the big 12 and it was AAC streaming, I've done games where the talent is in wherever San Antonio or something like that. Yeah. And I was the only live person I was doing the sideline, but I was the well, only person, my photographer and I, who were actually live and who were actually at the game. So, and, and I'm sure that there are a lot of, um, especially some of the smaller conferences, I'm sure they're, they're still doing that same thing. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it, it's changed, it's changed dramatically. And it's, it, it's a disconnect too, mm -hmm. that, that happens. And I've done games where they will send the, the announcers, but the producers and the directors and everybody else are back in Bristol or Charlotte in a control room. And that's totally messed up. That's, that's 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 difficult as well, but that's that's not going away anytime soon. Yeah, no, you're right. Um, any questions? Any questions from uh, the class, real quick? Jake, you got one. Thanks for hopping on with us today. I had a question on, basically, on how you prep, and this is a question that I I got asked by a freshman one time. I always like to ask industry professionals. So he asked me if you had your roster, what else yep. would you need? to broadcast a game. So you have your roster, both teams. What is that next thing? Maybe minus stats as well. What is that next other thing that you would need to broadcast a game effectively? Well, um, we, uh, let me see if I can grab a chart real quick. Um, yeah, I do charts that, um, this is a Mike Tirico chart and it's gonna be totally illegible to you guys, but those are, this is what? This is NC State women's basketball. So I have players, numbers, and then notes. And to do that, thank God for the internet. I, back in the day when I did football, Betsy, I don't care, we would get faxes from schools 
and your students probably might not know what a fax is, or we would get overnight packages from FedEx and they'd be about this thick. But now with the internet, um, so as far as preparation is concerned, uh, sports information directors, I think all deserve a place in heaven because they work so hard and they get stuff out and it's on the internet. So you just make sure you read the game notes. I like to read local, not used to be newspapers, uh, what local reporters are saying about teams. And schools have gotten really good as far as posting uh, post-game uh, news conferences and stuff like that or features on players. So I just try to get as much information as possible and put it on my charts. Everything can't fit. And I have a color-coded system. Uh, pinks are baby freshmen and things like that. And it's just I, I have a comfortability with this chart because I've been using it for basically 25 years. But there's just so much. I mean, it's the Internet. It's all that information, as I said, and that's good prep. And you have to just even if it's not on the chart, you're reading it or you're watching it and it gets in your brain and somehow you're able to to regurgitate it when the when the game is going on. But again, I would say 75 percent of what's on this chart probably doesn't make air, but it's there. It's almost like a cheat sheet, so, uh, so to speak. But, yeah, it's it's and that's I knew of people. It's funny. I've had people come up to me and go, wow, you you're doing a uh, Notre Dame Boston college. That must be nice to only work two hours a week. And I'm like, Whoa, 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 that's, that's not, it's not that. Um, and it's the fun part is when the ball is in the air, it's all the stuff that's before that. And it's hours of preparation. And fortunately, like I've had Notre Dame before. So that helps. I haven't had BC. So I'm kind of scrambling right now trying to get stuff on them, but yeah, it's, it's the internet, I think has changed everything. But the more information, there's so much out there and, and, and all the video, the video stuff helps a lot. And I've been a little resistant to that because I'm 100 years old, but there's that stuff helps a lot. Jake, you're in a beautiful setting. Is that? Oh, look at that. Yeah. yeah. Out your window, bud. <laughs> we're, in the main so we're in the Golden Dome, actually. Where oh, my goodness. Class oh, is, so. Nice. We're very, we're very fortunate here. Yeah, it's very picturesque. But I know like some of some of your students, Betsy, I know. you. So does everybody want to stay in sports broadcasting or is this dabbling or what's the what's the target audience here? I, I'll let them tell you. Anybody want to stay in this business for some reason? <laughs> sure. I had a question, but sure. um, I am going to stay in sports broadcasting. I think I can speak for most of the folks that I know in this room. I think they're going to stay in sports whether they're student athletes looking to continue that professional sports experience or break into either sports media and continue manning cameras or working in the control rooms um, or going to be in front of the camera. I think I'm speaking for the sample. I think we're all going to pretty much stay um, in the industry in some capacity. For myself, it's on camera. Um, and so my question to you um, is actually about work-life balance. Um, so you kind of mentioned, you know, people say, oh yeah, you only work two hours a week when you're covering that game. Um, my, my question to you is about sort of all those hours leading up. So how do you kind of draw the line between all the research that you're doing, all the preparation, all the notes you're taking, and then sort of closing it up, going to bed, um, and, and wrapping it up and saying I've done enough, um, and sort of a tangential piece to that question. Do you ever feel like watching sports doesn't become fun anymore? Do you ever feel like you're constantly working because you're watching that game? And you're like, maybe I should take a note on that because there's a team that I might be doing down the road um, that I might need to remember that that piece or that nugget. Um, yeah, thanks, sorry. Double fasted question there. No, no problem. Uh, what's your name? Maria. Maria. Maria, okay, Maria. First off, that second question, great question. Uh, and I and you're right. I. I and I think that, and Betsy could probably attest to this too. You, you look, you, when I watch sports now, I have found over the years that I'm becoming less of a fan because when I was like 11 years old, I was a Vikings fan. And when they lost, I literally sometimes couldn't go to school the next day. And if that happened with this year's Minnesota Vikings, I would never go to school. But, um, but it, you start to look at things differently. Like you look at production values. Why did they use that graphic? You know, his mic was cut off, whatever, things like that. You kind of nitpick. But yeah, you do look at things differently and I will watch games. Yes, you're right. Absolutely. Even if I know I'm not doing that team, they might say something and then, you know, I'm always Googling stuff to, to go further with that. So yes, it does change your perception. And I think it's, it's helpful uh, to, to, to listen to people and also to know what to find people that are good, that can give good information and then to kind of weed out the frauds. 
And, and it's also good to look at production values to say, well, that's good. And, and you can always pick up tips. Like if somebody makes a call, I'm like, that's a really good call and try. And one thing that's also valuable is to listen to yourself, to go back and watch games as painful as that is. Because sometimes, you know, I, everybody else can get a little repetitive on calls and you just, so that's always a, a great tool. Um, but yeah, you definitely, I would say definitely, especially the older I get, I definitely look at sports differently. And quite frankly, I don't sometimes watch a lot of sports because you, you get a little bit burned out on it, you know, and the fandom has kind of gone down a little bit. Things have changed so much. Oh my gosh. You know, football right now, I think is ruining college sports because, you know, Stanford, Cal and SMU are going to be in the ACC next year. The PAC 12 is gone. That's a whole nother tangent. So I think this is a really interesting time right now in sports that have made me a little more cynical and uh, and I and it's it's just a difficult time and we need football to separate but that's a whole other issue and then your other thing about work life balance um, I don't know it's just I think because I've done it so long and I've been doing ACC network games now since they started fortunately you I have a lot of stuff in my brain uh, as modeled as that is. And he just, I just, sometimes, I don't know. I just get to the point sometimes when I'm working, I'm like, that's it. I got to get up. I got to walk my dogs. I got to do something. But I think it's, it's something that it's internal probably. And the younger you are, you probably feel like, I know I totally, like I was prepping for football, like six, six, seven hours a day all week. And that was terrible. It was not the right thing to do. I wasn't, I was kind of missing the big picture of things by getting into the minutia. I would just say, you know, just to get the main points in your brain, Focus on the main players. And once you get, if you ever get to the point, like, what am I doing? Just walk away because that's going to be better for you in the long run. The work-life balance, I wouldn't say problem, but travel, we have to travel a lot. And some, and especially after the pandemic, travel, travel sucks. And you just have to kind of, kind of roll with it a little bit and just be prepared for that. So I always like to tell people, if you, you just have to be prepared for that. Don't think it's going to be like a walk in the park or you can step in right away and make a lot of money and get all these opportunities. That happens sometimes, but you're just going to have to realize that there's going to be days, like I still have, I have days like this now where I'm like, why am I, why am I doing this? But it's in the, in the long run. And, and once you get on site and you, and you talk to the players and you do it, it's so much fun. But you just have to be prepared that there's going to be a lot of stuff that's quite frankly, not that much fun, but, but you'll figure it out. I mean, you're a smart kid. You go to Notre Dame. You just need, you know, like anything else, just walk away from it. And, uh, and social media, let me bring that up real quick. When I started, there was no social media, right? Betsy, not even close. We would have comment sections on newspapers and I got crushed and women's women broadcasters got crushed, just mean, personal, terrible stuff. So I stopped reading that. And I know social media is a big part, especially your generation. But I would just say to everybody, don't define yourself by likes and followers. Just be true to yourself. You know when you do a good job. You know when you can improve. You don't need these idiots out there who probably hate their lives and just want to bring you down. So just just don't don't pay attention to that stuff, please. <laughs> I know I would. Uh, and Maria and I just had this discussion. I, when I would do Sports Center and there was a Virginia Tech highlight, well, you call it Va Tech, you know, after after you've said Virginia Tech once, then you call Va Tech, Va Tech. And there was a gal who would call every weekend and said, it's not Va Tech. There's not a, a school named Va Tech. And so anytime we were like, we would have our pre-production meeting and every time there was a Virginia Tech highlight, I said, give it to me, give it to me. So uh -huh. I would say Vatech just, yeah, to, just to, get, them. to yeah. get under her skin. But I don't know what you have found, but I have found like every time, like even before I got to ESPN and I would fill in here at the local stations, I would fill in in sports. Uh -huh. The next morning I would go into the news director and I'd say, well, and he go, well, we got we got a couple of calls. We got a couple of calls from women. We got a couple of calls from women who didn't think that uh, women should be doing sports. Yeah, it was never men. They just kind Certainly. of accepted it. And women were the ones who would come after me doing sports instead of, hey, isn't that cool? Let's lift everybody up. And yeah. drives me crazy. Yeah, and that's, I had a lot of men come after me. I, I think football was probably the great divider. 
uh, with that. But that's something I think that's still going on that's really heart wrenching is there are a lot of women who are misogynists and they want and that's, you know, and again, we and back when we were there, you mentioned there were five out of 50 and there we're still a minority. It's getting better. And I, I think in a lot of places and ESPN was like this, quite frankly, where they almost like pitted, pitted us against each other because there only had to be one. There would be one main anchor on Sports Center, one play-by-play -play person, one, 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 one. Sort of that token mentality that um, I think is still rather disturbingly still pervasive, not just with us, but with other people. Uh, so that's 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 part of one of the other messages I wanted to get across was opportunity is a big word. And I think right now there are, as I mentioned, more opportunities to get into things. And I'm not just talking about women or people of color. I think it's great. Finally, finally, you know, way too late those opportunities are opening up and um and i think the, the whole thing with you know with all of the you know the george floyd and brianna you know, all that stuff were you know terrible things that had to happen in order for i think our my bosses certainly to wake up and realize that there were other people out there that needed to be represented but i think the opportunities are more because there are more platforms but i still think once you get in the opportunities are still overwhelmingly not great for minorities and women. Uh, and there are, so that's something that, I, that I've tried to get across to my bosses too, is give us equal opportunity. And I know Muffet McGraw tweeted something got a couple months ago, the Phoenix Mercury in the WNBA hired a man who had been an assistant in the NBA, never coached women and automatically they hire him. And he's the highest paid coach in the WNBA, higher paid than Becky Hammond, who I think is making a million a year, which is good in this league. Uh, and Becky's won two, two, two championships. Like she's the best coach in the league. And, and Muffet had talked about like, like women are hired on their potential. Men are just hired period. And I think that that's something that, and I'm sorry, guys, I don't, I'm not trying to crap on you or anything, but I just think the opportunities certainly are once you get in, you might get it in a lower level. You're certainly getting paid less on in most instances. And I just think more opportunities. So I would just say be persistent about that. Because Betsy, when I was hired at ESPN News, I found out recently from a former ESPN News anchor that he was hired and was making like 45% more than I was. Yes. I had no idea. And he just kind of casually, yeah, we were hired at, and he mentioned a figure. And I'm like, dude, that <laughs> was not me. But, and, and, I, and unfortunately, and I've heard stories from people, again, not just in my own network. I have friends all across the country who work for different people. So that's still there. So the good news is we're getting more opportunities, but I think we have to be persistent in getting further opportunities. You know, there's still not enough women calling men sports, period, across the board. I mean, we have some, we have a couple doing NBA, Kate Scott and uh, Lisa Byington are NBA people, but I just think that that's still an ongoing battle and just, you know, opportunity is, is the big thing right now for me or in lack thereof. Yeah, and you're right. Sometimes you just have to keep your head down and keep working and, and just ignore the noise. Yeah, and yeah, yeah definitely ignore the noise, but also you have to, I would say, let your bosses, let your, uh, the people who are above you and just let them know. Cause I, you know, I, I would go and say, I want to do whatever they go. Oh, we had no idea you want to do that, whatever. But meanwhile, you're letting other people just waltz in and get those opportunities. And uh, it's, it's, it's frustrating. And unfortunately, what are we a quarter of the way through the 21st century and that's still going on. So just be persistent, let them know, because some bosses will use any excuse not to, you know, not to think outside the box. I mean, most, you know, most of our bosses, Norby Williamson is still the ESPN, and he was, he's been there since day one when he started in the mailroom. So a lot of times their thinking is very, you know, uh, you know, just very laser sharp. And you just have to let them know that, that you are interested and, and be persistent. Yeah, exactly. Um, any other questions? Do we have anybody else? Hi, I'm Ari. Thank you for being here. Sure, um, I wanted to ask a question kind of about problem solving on the job and if you've ever had a situation that kind of things went wrong or you had difficulty collaborating with someone and how you kind of dealt with that. Problem solving. Um, gosh, that's, well, I've been on the air when our, uh, our comms went down, when I could, we couldn't hear, we couldn't hear each other, things like that. Is that what you're talking about? Like technical things or? I'm trying to think, God dang, I've done, sorry, I've done hundreds of games. Um, and that's, well, I think one thing that helped me, I, I did a lot of radio. You have to just kind of learn to think on your feet. 
because things do happen. I, there can be disruptions in games and things like that. I've done, unfortunately, a couple of games where there are catastrophic injuries and things like that um, and technical things. I don't know, Ari. It's just you just kind of have to take a breath and not the most important thing is never say anything you're not sure of, you know, because you don't want to speculate about stuff. Um, one of my mantras has become when in doubt, be vague. You know, if you're not sure about something, you don't have to be specific. You just kind of let it have to let it roll and, and go along. Are there any examples you can think of that maybe you you faced or would be a problem? Are you asking me? Sorry. Um, yeah, problem solving. Yeah, I don't know. Man, you just got it. And that's the beauty of it. I love doing live television, right? Betsy, live television, there's nothing like it. Because, but you just have to have to learn to roll with it. And I think the more experience you get, the the so-called better you will be. And you also who you're with. If you have a good analyst, if you have a good production team, you can kind of help each other through it. But you just gotta think on your feet and and just roll with it. And sometimes it's not going to be awesome, but you learn from that and then you move on. Yeah. Well, and a good example of that. I mean, you know, we were at ESPN when uh, Twin Towers went down on 9/11. Oh. And, you know, I remember being on the air from nine that morning until four in the afternoon. And we didn't know. Nobody knew until we got, you know, about about halfway through. And, and I and I and I always tell people, I said I was saying words that I never thought I would say on the air. I was saying an apparent terrorist attack upon the United States. And I go, I cannot believe I'm sitting here saying those words. And, yeah. you know, and that and that is one of those examples, like you say, if you don't know and none of us, none of us knew for for quite some time, you can't speculate. Um, you know, we in class, we've looked at the DeMar Hamlin incident mm. and mm. Uh, we had Dan Horde who calls the games for the Bengals. We had Dan Ward on a couple of weeks ago and he was saying that, I mean, people were people were just throwing out all kinds of information and it wasn't information. They were just speculating. Oh, he's dead. Oh, he's a vegetable. Oh, he's that. Yeah. And, and he said that, you know, we just didn't say anything that you couldn't see. And he, right. and he said like every once in a while, the, the players would part and you could see them physically, obviously pumping on his chest. So you could report that. But I think that's, that's a really good, Thing to kind of go into those situations that if you don't know, be vague because we didn't know. Right. You don't and know. It, yeah. And that's another part of the poisoning of social media is people are posting this stuff. And, and, and I get irritated sometimes when I see networks like post what people like they'll say, oh, you know, Joe Blow and on Twitter, I refuse to call it X, uh, said so and so. And it's like, who, you know, so what? It, it's, it's, there's no vetting. There's no, and that's, that's become a problem with the 24 hour news cycle is stuff gets on the air. And, um, you know, I, I know ESPN tries to be really careful with that, but sometimes there's so, there's so much, so much misinformation out there. And it's, you don't need to be part of that. Just, just stay back. And like I, I did a game um, the day that Kobe Bryant was killed. And I found out literally right before we went on the air and, you know, G, you know, his daughter and, you know, I, not, I don't want to say I knew them, you know, I'd met them and knew they were great advocates for women's basketball. And it was hard. It was really hard. And I went back and I, you know, I watched the game and I was like, I should have been more eloquent. I should have maybe personalized it more, but it's, you know, you, you were there, you know, when the towers got hit. So that's, it's, but you're human and you just, you know, if you can show your humanity, it's okay to show that you're shaken up because it's all a shared experience. And, and quite frankly, sometimes terrible things happen. And most people, I mean, we're trying to deal with it in real time when there's not a lot of information. So yeah, just, just I just say, be very, very careful. And, and it's okay to show your humanity there. Absolutely. Um, any more questions? We've got about 10 minutes or so to uh, talk a little bit more about Pam's experiences. Any other questions? Where we go? Yeah. I, had a, okay. I had a question, Pam. I, I worked a couple games behind the scenes when you came in with Jenny for the ACC tournament. Can you talk about, like, you guys have a great chemistry together and you guys build off of each other really well. And it's almost like you guys read each other's minds because as yeah. soon as you got off one point, she's coming in to take another. So it's really like one of those great instances of a great booth pairing that I just thought really works well. So if you could take us through how that was able to come about, uh, especially between you and Jenny. 
you know, that's a that's a great question. And that's a that's something that is a blessing to find uh, a pairing like that, a broadcast partner. She's play by play or I'm play by play. She's an analyst. She was if you would Google Jenny Dalton Hill, she was one of the greatest softball players ever, but played in the pre TV era. I think in one season she had like 122 RBIs in 70 games. It's just sick. Um, and one of the and we couldn't be more different as human beings. She's a Mormon kid from Salt Lake. I'm this, you know, godless, you know, East Coast <laughs> human being. And, but she's one of my best friends. And I think that's just something that you can't fake. And she's the closest I've ever been to a partner. But the most important thing, I mean, we've become really good friends, uh, have had great conversations off the field. But I think the most important thing, well, we, we respect each other and you have to listen to each other. And that's one of the things I know, Betsy, you guys are talking about interviewing. And that's very important is listening. And I think the thing with Jenny and I just became organic over, over the years. And I appreciate you saying that because she's the best. And I love a lot of my former analysts, but I just think we, we click the best on air. And one thing about softball that I love is, you know, basketball is pretty fast. Softball, you have in between pitches, you can you can carry over thoughts, you can formulate sort of a storyline, and none of that is planned. It just kind of happens. I'll see something, she'll see something, but we listen to each other. And you know, we lean on each other when when things might go uh, go a little wonky. And and that's I mean, that's a blessing. And I'm hearing they might be breaking us up this year, which breaks my heart. But um, but that's that's something that Jake very rarely happens. And I'm I don't know. If, if you guys watch sports, again, with not as a fan, but critically, there are some play-by-play -play people, some of whom are quite prominent, who say what they say, the analyst says what they say, it's like there's no interplay. It's like somebody talks, the other guy talks, and I hate that. I think that interplay is so important, and, and I don't think you get it a lot, and Jenny and I are very fortunate in that, but I would just say, just listen. Don't be concerned about the next thing you're going to say, and oftentimes... I, I've, you know, you see interviews and somebody might say something quite provocative and then the interviewer will just move on to the next thing. It's like, listen, react. And, and just, just, I think that's, I think a lot of it with Jenny and I, besides the fact that we're really good friends is, you know, we listen to each other and we just keep bouncing stuff off each other. And with softball, you have the luxury of time. We wouldn't have that luxury in basketball, maybe football, but certainly not in basketball. Anybody else real quick? Sean? Uh, hi, I'm Sean. Um, what would be your best piece of advice to give to someone like me who, you know, doesn't really have much experience with this and just wants to find a, find a way to grow and to find my way just in the industry? So you, you think you want to stay in broadcasting, sports broadcasting, but you're not sure what? You, you're a student, I assume, right? Yes. You're in the band? All right. Um, um, I would just say, I don't know, is in the, that was actually one of the points you bring up something. One of the points I wanted to make is that um, just take advantage of whatever opportunities you get and try out different things. Because I know a lot of people, especially I know when I was still doing football, especially I, students would come up to me on campuses and they would go and it, you know, overwhelmingly the women, I want to be a sideline reporter. And I was like, no. Um, you don't pigeon, pigeonhole yourself into something. Try different things and don't feel, and I know being on air sounds exciting and blah, 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 it's not. But um, there are so many other things and we need, because so many sports are on now. I mean, you, you guys know this, you know, every sport it seems is being streamed now. Just try different roles. It, you don't have to be in front of the camera. Good, God knows we need good producers. And the producers are the ones, you know, in charge of it and they work their butts off. That's, that's good producers are so hard to find. Be a director, be an audio person, be a camera operator, whatever, be sports information, whatever. I would just say, just try as many things as you can. And I think hopefully with the opportunities and with, you know, campus stuff going on, just try different roles and maybe you'll find one that you love. And, and conversely, you can go, oh no, I don't, like I took a directing class at Maryland. I lasted, I, I think I walked out of the first class. I didn't even last one class. I'm like, no, this isn't for me. So just, you know, just try out different things. You know, you're young, you have your whole, you know, a lot of stuff ahead of you and get as much experience as you can. And, and then you can pick and choose and go, no, I don't want to do this. And you'll, you'll hit on something. And in the meantime, 
you'll gain experience all across the board. And that will be like when I started in TV, I had to shoot my own stuff. So I was a photographer, I was an editor, and it gives you not just an appreciation, but an understanding of what goes into to make this happen. Because what goes on in those control rooms and product, it's chaos. And I, I have so much admir ad admiration for people who go through that because we're just like, you know, the head of the snake and we don't know what's going on back there. And uh, it's a lot. And so there are a lot of different roles. I would just say, try out stuff, get rid of the stuff you don't like, and, and just basically just follow your heart, find a passion and go for it. And if it's not TV, if it's not sports broadcasting, then you know that too. Better to find it out, out now than later. Yep. Yep. <laughs> I've got one more, I've got time for one more question. If anybody has one more question. Anyone, Shannon? Um, hi, thank you so much for talking to us today. I just sure. had a quick question about um, the football season that you were kind of explaining. I'm not sure if I want to work in broadcasting or just in football in general, since that's um, like my favorite sport. But I just didn't know what the transition was like once you aren't focused on the games. Like, what do you do in the off season? Um, and even just if you're thinking of people who are working in football in general, like how does that transition happen? So when you say working in football, what do you mean? What, what would that be? Working for a team, being a general manager? We need those. Game um, maybe <laughs> someday. High. But um, I was thinking more like football operations yeah. or kind of just behind the scenes stuff with the team. Yeah, that's uh, well. For I, that's great, and I know more and more women are getting into that, which is which is terrific. Um, yeah, the you talk about off season of football. What what would one do? I mean, you just try to keep up with stuff. And um, but I would when I was doing it, and I don't want to do, I don't want to scare you away from doing football. I just, as a broadcaster, it's just a whole different beast. And uh, and I, I I hope things have changed because when I was doing it, I think we only had six crews. Now we have a million. Mm -hmm. So there's there there are different ways to to do things now, but yeah, just in the off season, I would I would literally just take a couple of weeks and just breathe, but then you have you do have to keep up with stuff, and with the internet, you just you know just 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 keep up with whatever's happening. But certainly, it it wasn't it didn't become anything all encompassing. But if you love football, I think that's great. That's a passion, and 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 one thing too with especially the student athletes here who want to get into something. You know, you can use your expertise, not just on air, but all across. I mean, we need people who are saturated with all this other knowledge and all your other skill sets. But yeah, just again, just if you love football, there's hopefully there'll be certainly more opportunities for you than when Betsy and I were getting out of school when they were, quite frankly, in football zero. So I don't know, just just go for it. If you love football, go for it. Anyone else real quick before we start to wrap it up? Uh, Pam, the one thing that I've noticed and, and very similar to what you just said, um, especially high school girls, especially high school girls, they will come up to me and say, just what you said about, I wanna do sidelines, I wanna be Aaron Andrews. You know what, we all wanna be Aaron Andrews, all right? Okay, let's just put that out there. Other than that, I don't think that they realize that if you're talking about the time, the exposure that you get, Aaron Andrews gets a pregame, a postgame, and a couple of hits during the game. I mean, yeah. if you want to be the star of the show, you wanna be in the booth, you wanna do that. Uh, I think that, you know, it's something that, and and as we know, we are looking more and more at what our um, si female sideline reporters say and don't say and report and don't report. And we've we've touched a little bit on that. And and I do have, uh, by the way, we uh, we have talked a lot about just what you can say and what you can't say. Uh, we have uh, Jack Rinaldi is here in the class. Uh, his dad's Tom, one of the best. Oh, uh, yeah, unbelievable. One, yeah, one of the best that is out there. But I think that, and again, tell me if I'm being too sensitive about this, but it just seems that women are two steps forward and one step back. You get on the sidelines, you have very good reporters, female reporters who are on the sidelines. And then Aaron comes out and says, oh, yeah, sometimes I make up stuff, too. I go, what? Yeah, First of all, true. why would you admit that? I don't care whose podcast it is, if it's your podcast or somebody else's. Why would you admit it? And second of all, 
why would you do that? It, as you said, there is so much information out there, so many sources you can get information. There's no reason to do that. No, it's, and that's, and I know it wasn't Aaron, it was another reporter who, and she remarkably still Carissa. has her job. Uh, was Carissa, it? Yeah, Carissa Thompson. She thank was, you. Thank yeah. you. Who used to work for us and, uh -huh. uh, but uh, ESPN. Uh, first off, that's, I think she should have been fired. <laughs> And uh, yeah, honest, I mean, that's that's just unacceptable. You're making stuff up. But I think it seems to me like a lot of stuff is made up now. A lot of lies are are acceptable and people aren't being held accountable. Uh, media outlets aren't doing their jobs and holding not, you know, we're seeing politicians who aren't being held accountable for things they're saying and doing. But that's abominable to me. And and it's fine. If you want to be a sideline reporter, fantastic. I have the honor of working with Holly Rowe, who I think is the best all time. Lisa Salters, who does Monday Night Football and has done it longer than any other reporter. Fantastic. They, they're they really great at their jobs, but I think a lot of it still is, quite frankly, it's eye candy. And there are people who want their own clothing line and they want followers, whatever, but that's not being a reporter. And another person I really respect, Kaylee Hartung, who worked for us for a while now with NBC. I saw a piece she did where she for she does Amazon, I guess, Thursday night NFL games. And she prepared and you and the, these sideline reporters, God bless them. I, I was a sideline reporter for about a season and a half. I was terrible. I was miserable. I knew it wasn't for me. Going back to that point, try stuff out. And if you don't like it, punt it. Um, she did a, a story where she prepared. I, I believe it was at least 20, let's say 25 stories. And in the open, when you first come on the air, She's uh, blah, 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 whatever, Jake Allen. And she looked at the camera because they're just following her for this, like, look, this piece. And she said, wow, got my story on. And then at the end, she's like, I have one down, 24 to go. And at the end, they went back to her. She said she got one story on. That's it. She didn't get anything else in the game. And that's dictated, again, by the game. It could be dictated by the producers. I know announcers that have waved off. They're like, no, I'm not going to that reporter. That happens. So, so there's, I mean, it's really hard to be a good sideline reporter. And she worked her butt off with these meetings and talking to people. They got one report in. They went to her for other stuff, like what happened. And Kaylee's not going to make up that a coach talked to her when, when they didn't. But that's, that's just part of it. That's just part of it. So sideline reporting looks glamorous, but it's hard work. You're not going to get on a lot. You know the place to do now is studio. You're going to get, you, you know, you, you get on a lot and... And, and some of those people are, are, you know, cashing in as well. So that's kind of, I think, and, and you get to show more of your personality, more of your knowledge, things like that. So I would hope that this generation of women are kind of segueing away from thinking, oh, I want to be a, stu a sideline reporter. No, <laughs> it's hard work. And uh, I don't, and, and most of the time, I don't think it really pays off. For what you get less out of it, certainly what you put into it. Yeah, yeah very true. Uh, well, as we wrap it up, Pam, you've uh, already given students uh, some great advice on how they can kind of grow their business, they grow their broadcasting background, how they get prepared. But just as we wrap up, give us some advice. It's not all roses. It's <laughs> not It's not the big paycheck. Uh, it's not something that you can do if you're not passionate about. Yeah. And I think that in the back of your heads, you have to decide yourself whether right. you are passionate about it. But Pam, just give us a few words of encouragement, of advice. How do these students get to where they want to go? Um, just be, don't take no for an answer. And if you, like, like Betsy said, if you have a passion for it, just go for it. I mean, and, and the thing that sometimes when I have to get up and take a 6 a.m. flight and I'm up at four in the morning and I'm grumpy because I just got off the air six hours ago, I'm thinking, I'm looking at people driving on the freeway or, you know, go, and I'm like, these people are getting up every five days a week at this ungodly hour to go do a job they probably don't like, or they certainly don't love. And with all the residual stuff, I love my job. I, I'm for, I've worked hard for it, uh, but so I would, again, I just, you know, just follow your passion, find something you love. And if it isn't this, that's fine. And if, if you find a job that you like, or if you're really fortunate that you love, then you're, I think, ahead of probably 80% of the population because God, it would have to suck to work for a living. <laughs> I, I never go into the office, Betsy, never. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> well, you know, that's 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 okay. Uh, as I said, yes. we had our we had our little enclave there in Bristol, Connecticut, because there yeah. wasn't anything else except the friendlies across the street. And then when they put in a McDonald's, it was like a big yeah. day. You know? Yeah, I think they both closed now. <gasps> Oh yeah, God. I think since the pandemic, it, you know, it was harder to get in and out of the building. Yeah. So the, the cafeteria has expanded greatly, uh, but it's still, yeah, it, it is. It's like it's it's its own little island. Yeah, yeah it is. Oh, and um, uh, by the way, a little trivia. And and uh, does anybody know Millie Vanilli? Do you know that name <laughs> at all? Millie Vanilli? They're too young. I know they are. Google it. Um, it, it spelled with an I on each. Millie Vanilli was hot for about 30 seconds back in the 90s, late 90s, mid 90s. The downfall of Millie Vanilli was at Lake Compounds, which is basically across the street in Bristol, Connecticut. They were doing an MTV something or other. The downfall of Millie Vanilli was that they had the tape in the back and they were lip syncing. And mm -hmm. nobody knew it until the tape broke. And then there was Millie and Vanilli. And <laughs> everybody found out at the same time they couldn't sing. So <laughs> that's that's the 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 big claim to fame, that and Otis Elevator in yes. Earth, Connecticut. The, uh, yeah, the so. Otis Elevator and, yeah, right across the street. I, yeah, think the tallest, well, I think it might be the tallest building in Connecticut. Yeah, I think wow. it is. Woo, Bristol. So, yeah, <laughs> yes. really. So anyway, I got Chris McHenry. I got... Pam Ward, I got Linda Cohn, I got Robin Roberts up here that always reminds me of, you know, yeah. of all the anchors that were at ESPN when we started. It was us yeah. five. It was yep. us five. I'll never forget that. And Pam, fab five. <laughs> yeah, we fab five. Pam took me under her wing and we we shot pool and we did all kinds of cool oh, things. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's about all there is to do. So, Pam, I cannot tell you how much I appreciate your time. Been sure. too long. We will catch up. I'll make sure that I check out your um, broadcast schedule, and uh, hopefully we can get together next time you're on campus. Yep, hope so. Thanks, all everyone, right. and, and best of luck to all you guys. Just stick with it. Yeah. It'll be great. All right. Thank you, Pam. Thanks, right. everybody.